It's with great pleasure that I get the opportunity now to introduce somebody I've had the pleasure of working with for months now, four or five months now, putting together this really cool event. This has just been a really exciting opportunity for me. Maureen Co uh, Costello, director of the Teaching Tolerance Project, uh, project of the Southern Poverty Law Center, has been just an in indispensable part of putting this together. And I just wanted to bring her to the stage to get us started here. She'll be presenting today's teachers with their awards. Good afternoon, everyone. I am the Director of Teaching Tolerance, which is a project of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I'm very pleased because it is the part of the center's work that focuses on the future by working with teachers across the nation. What we do is we work with educators from K to 12 and actually also many in college to promote inclusive and equitable schools. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome you all to this special gathering in our nation's capital in this extremely pristine room. Um, today, Teaching Tolerance, with the support of our colleagues at the Richard Riley, Richard W. Riley, sorry, uh, College of Education and Leadership at Walden University, honors five K-12 educators who have demonstrated excellence in teaching students from diverse racial, ethnic, and linguistic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. The awardees were selected through a rigorous process, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and will each receive $1,000 um, to use in any way they wish. We brought them to Washington for this event, and we're very, very pleased to be able to uh, share their work with you. We videotaped them, and they are uh, examples of their practice will be used to help educate um, educators and pre-service teachers around the nation. Uh, in producing this event, Teaching Tolerance is extremely pleased also to be partnering with Education Week Teacher. Education Week Teacher is an interactive resource connecting America's K-12 teachers with America's education uh, newspaper of record. Teacher strives to bring teacher leaders together around essential conversation in education and instruction. So our interests have really come together very, very nicely for this event. I am very excited to be here today, and not only to honor our awardees, but also to provide you and our virtual audience with an opportunity to explore the kind of teaching that we really value at Teaching Tolerance, the kind of teaching that is built on relationships and which values the worth of each individual student in front of us. We all know that quality teaching is the single most important school-based influence on student learning. And we also know that there are unacceptable gaps in the academic achievement of students from different racial, cultural, ethnic, and linguistic backgrounds. And those gaps have been around for a very long time. Among the things that we can do to address these gaps is to help teachers divide, de develop the kind of expertise that will better equip them to effectively teach those students who are most in need of achieving at much higher levels. And this expertise that we're going to be talking about today is often called culturally responsive pedagogy or, or culturally responsive teaching. A key purpose of this award and of this event is to enhance our profession's understanding of what culturally responsive teaching looks like, what these practices look like. We want to explore how these practices can benefit all students, not simply students of color, and to find out what it may take to have more students learn from culturally responsive teachers. And we have some of the finest of them in front of us today. Culturally responsive pedagogy has already won over researchers. The past three presidents of the American Educational Research Association are experts on it. Our challenge now is to bridge that gap between research and practice by showing what it looks like and by sharing evidence on its effectiveness. So with the generous support, again, of the Richard W. Riley College of Education and Leadership at Walden University and with the assistance of a number of other organizations, Teaching Tolerance sought to identify five exemplars of the practice whose work with diverse students is superb. We would film their teaching and we would share their expertise with schools of education, with school districts, with professional associations, and with others who shape the quality of teaching. But before we get to the awards presentations, I'd like to introduce you to someone 
who is very, very special to the Teaching Tolerance Program, and without whom we could not have put this event together or, in fact, just been here at all. Bill Hawley is Professor Emeritus of Education and Public Policy at the University of Maryland, which names, and to name only two items on his rather extensive CV, he is the former Dean of the College of Education at Maryland and of Peabody College at Vanderbilt. He was instrumental in developing and overseeing the processes for identifying these awardees and helping us all get the celebration off the ground. In fact, more than off the ground here today. Um, and I just lost my place. Uh, he, um, Bill, holds a PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, and taught at both Yale and Duke before going to Vanderbilt. He has written books on elections, on politics and government organization, and is a notable expert on school desegregation. For the last five years, Bill has directed the Teaching Diverse Students Initiative at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and he is today a senior advisor to the Teaching Tolerance Program. Fortunately for us, he has also been the moving force in identifying for us the importance of culturally responsive pedagogy and in identifying and selecting the awardees and so much more. Bill, let me thank you and I'd like you all to give my friend Bill Hawley a warm round of applause. Thank you all for, for coming. <clears throat> um, we recognize these teachers today with uh, great enthusiasm, but we also do this because we want you to leave here uh, if you are not already so committed to the idea that every student should have a teacher like the ones you're going to learn about. Uh, whenever I talk to people about this, they say, oh, that's neat stuff, you know? It's uh, stuff that we might want to do because it'll make kids feel better, enhance their self-esteem, and all of that's true. Well, the reason we're here is because culturally responsive pedagogy is essential to the learning opportunities of a very large number of American kids. Um, I expect you wouldn't be here if you didn't already think that this was a worthy topic, but I draw your attention to the fact that you probably practice culturally responsive pedagogy every day even if you're not a teacher. Because when you talk to somebody <clears throat> and you're trying to understand what they say, you may ask yourself, where are they coming from? Uh, when somebody uh, talks to you about uh, something not quite get it, you say to yourself, hmm, the equivalent of, let me walk in there, maybe if I could walk in their shoes. Or when you think about a relationship you want to have with a group of people or with an individual, on a difficult task, you might ask yourself, can I trust this person? Are they going to be there when I need them? Are they going to respect the perspectives that I bring to them, bring to the table? Those and many others are the essential fundamental aspects of culture responsive pedagogy. So all of you are, because you're successful folks, practitioners. And the reason I mention that is because this is not an exotic practice that is good only for students of color. It's only about you know, self-esteem. So um, the uh, next question one might ask yourself, one of my advisors in Berkeley said, uh, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Uh, that translates into the following problematizing, if you will, of issues, and that is if culture responsive teaching is such a great idea, why isn't there more of it? Um, we could spend a lot of time on that topic, I won't, but uh, one reason is it's because it's difficult. It's, tr it's understanding the complexity of, the, of what kids bring with them to school and how we build relationships with groups and with individuals, avoiding stereotypes. Um, you, will, you have in your packet of stuff <laughs> some, uh, a brief summary of research on teaching. So the reason we don't do more of it is not because there's not good evidence. As I say, it's hard work. And teachers, by and large, do not get much support in doing it. But another reason we don't do it much is because we don't want to acknowledge that race and ethnicity are as important as they are in the lives of all of us, right? 
that we want to believe this is all about poverty. <laughs> uh, and it is about poverty. It is about the opportunities kids have in their lives. But race, ethnicity, culture, language are the identities that we have as individuals. And if we don't respect that in our, our relationships and build on them, treat those as assets, uh, we're going to be less successful in our development, in our working with these kids. So, um, one final reason I would say that you, we don't uh, see as much of this as we'd like to is because we don't see as much of this as we'd like to. Which is a way of saying that when we, when I talk to people about this and we say, what, you know, I do that. Uh, but in fact, most teachers don't do this. And so what you're going to have the opportunity today, today is to see a little bit of what we're talking about here, if you haven't already. And uh, again, what I hope we will leave us with is, a, is, a, is the idea that we need to not only improve teacher preparation and professional development, but put this issue back, or never been on, back onto the policy agenda because it's just not part of what we talk about very much in terms of trying to improve student performance. So, um, my, my next duty, uh, pleasure, pleasurable duty, is to welcome to the uh, podium Kate Steffens, who is the, uh, did I get that right, Kate? Oh, I have my note, I'm in notes on that. So, uh, who is the dean of the Richard W. Riley School of Education, College of Education at Walden University. Uh, her colleagues and she have made this event possible and we're grateful. Thanks. Thank you, Bill, for your kind introduction. It is indeed a pleasure to share the stage with you and to have this opportunity to recognize your groundbreaking work with the Teaching Tolerance, Tolerance Initiative. You are a wonderful example of the impact one educator can make in the lives of so many. This idea that one individual can make a greater difference lies at the very heart at the mission of the Richard W. Riley College of Education and Leadership. Our goal is to help enhance the effectiveness of educators so they, in turn, can enhance the learning and achievements of others. Our college, named for the former Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, seeks to support the needs of educa educators at every stage of their development. From those who are just beginning their teaching careers to established educators, advancing their knowledge and skills through our master's and doctoral degree programs. We count more than 50,000 students and alumni as part of our learning community and we continue to be recognized as one of the leading online education programs in the nation. Today's recipients of the Teaching Tolerance Award for Excellence in Culturally Responsive Teaching are strong examples of the kind of educators we wish to support in our programs. Educators who are leading positive change in their own lives as well as the lives of others. And that is why Walden University is excited to support their efforts and celebrate their achievements today. As Maureen said, in the spirit of sharing best practices with an even larger audience of teachers, we have videotaped these honorees in their actual classrooms, capturing their most effective teaching techniques so they can be shared with teachers nationwide through the Southern Poverty Law Center's Professional Development Initiative. Recognizing educators who have found innovative ways to improve student learning and academic achievement is another important goal at Walden. We do not believe that good is enough when better is possible. So we continue to seek out partners and experts to help contribute to, contribute to and advance the body of knowledge in the field of education. Whether it's research in such areas as technology, diversity, 21st century skills. We have a passion for education and are committed to strengthening, inspiring, and celebrating our nation's teaching workforce. On behalf of Walden University and the Richard W. Riley College of Education and Leadership, 
I congratulate this year's award recipients. You are to be commended for your commitment to ensuring that all children are successful in the classroom regardless of their racial, ethnic, and cultural background. <laughs> in fact, you show us the value that comes in celebrate and embracing our diversity, and we look forward to your continued success. And now I'd like to invite Marina to the podium to present our honorees with their award. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Now it is on to our main event, announcing the recipients of the Teaching Tolerance Award for Culturally Responsive Pedagogy. Um, a note, a little bit to explain the process that we used. Uh, in the first half of this year, with the help of many organizations, including the National Education Association, EDWEEK, the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, uh, the National Association of for multicultural education and others. Teachers were invited to apply for the award and fill out a rather lengthy application. A panel of nationally prominent scholars and board certified teachers selected the awardees after the and afterwards the finalists were interviewed. I'm sorry, after the finalists were interviewed, and in most cases actually observed in their classrooms. Teachers race or subjects taught the subjects that they taught played absolutely no role in the selection. The panel focused on what the teachers did in their diverse schools and classrooms and on evidence that their students achieved at high levels. So these teachers were selected from a very, very large national pool and they are fabulous. I've had the opportunity to spend some time with them in the last uh, day or so and I'm really impressed and I think you will be too. So first, I would like to share with you the work of Silvestre Arcos, middle school teacher at the Laboratory School of Finance and Technology in Bronx, New York, a city close to my part. Originally a math teacher, and in fact still a math teacher, um, Arcos now also directs a dual language program that honors the first language skills of students and also results in soaring scores. Let's take a moment to watch Silvestre in action. MS-223 is located in the South Bronx area, which is the poorest congressional district in the country. There are 31 students in the class. Most of them are Latino. Amongst the Latinos that we have, there is a wide variety. I use the students' culture in almost every lesson that I do. I use their names, I'll use their heritage. And then the other summits, which are the... Mariachi. Okay, good. Mr. Argos has brought culture into the classroom in a number of different ways. And our students are from many different places, so being able to bring in their families lets the students see how they're similar and also what the differences are, and looking at that and studying it and celebrating it. Even though it's, it is a math class, it's important for me to be cognizant of the students' English reading levels because I have to know, is this really a numeracy problem or is it a literacy problem? Five, you got this? Fist, I need help, okay? Fist to five, show me with your hands. So they know that they have language partners in math class that they are working with. And so I'll pair a high student with a medium student to scaffold them to grow this way, and a low student with a medium student, again, to, to get them to grow to proficiency. The students are going to get there, and they do get there. We're all getting there together. When students know that you have a close relationship with families, that you can say hi to them on the street, that you talk to them on the phone, that they're welcome to come into the classroom, they feel more comfortable with you as well. Mr. Arcos makes us feel like a family and team. We solve our problems and everything. You're always going to have to work together because you are a team and a family. So the students are, are welcome to take risks, and it's important to take risks in learning. Without reflection and team building, you have that atmosphere where students feel comfortable and take risks and hold each other accountable. Good morning, team and family. Good morning, Karen. 
I apologize to Mr. Arcos and everybody here for interrupting the things he was talking about and interrupting everybody. Do you accept my apology? Yes. Thank you. If you're coming from behind like most of my students are, you have to put in more time in order to get to that same level. And I'm here to support the students in that way. I want you to say yeah after that. Okay? So go ahead and, and say it again, Caroline. I'm not going to yeah. 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 Do you know do you know how in that the makes future, it different? Um, now you don't know, but in the future you will know better. Nice. Which is our big goal, right? I know there is an urgency. If you look at literacy rates, it's a crisis, especially here in the community of the South Bronx. So I know that this is where I need it. And what I'm doing is providing the support to my students so that they can break the stereotypes, so that they can excel, they can get into the best high schools and into the best universities and break the cycle of poverty so that we can uplift the community. Silvestre, join me on stage. <laughs> Sylvester, on behalf of the Southern Poverty Law Center and of the Richard W. Riley College of Education, I want to give you this award for your performance and your exemplary modeling of culturally um, responsive at the teaching. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. Now I would like to introduce the work of Sonia Galaviz, whose fifth grade class at Endeavor Elementary School in Nampa, Idaho, includes Mexican American, Asian, Native American, and white children whose families work in agriculture. Sonia begins the school year with home visits and engages parents as full partners and important sources of knowledge in their children's education. Now, I think it may be fair to say that few of us think of Nampa, Idaho, uh, when we think of culturally diverse populations. <laughs> However, in fact, more and more places across the country have very diverse populations. And Galadiz has brought a tremendous change to this small farming community where she lives. I think with this video, we get to take a look into her world and the world of her students. I feel like it's important to understand each child on a personal level so I know how best to teach them. For me, it's important that they're making connections between home and community and school. My philosophy of education is that these are human beings and I have been given the opportunity and the gift to be a part of that and I want to make it count. And I go and visit each one of the families before the first day of school and I need to make that connection with the family so I know how to teach how to reach that child best. Her culture is very, very different than some of the kids in the class. How can she still connect with a tale like Columbus? It's so far removed. Well, Allison's Indian. Her dad is Indian. By the time we start school, I've already started to develop lessons and develop opportunities to share and to be able to tap in what the home has told me, what I think is best, and what's gonna bring us together as a classroom community. I really focus on getting to know each other on a cultural basis as cultural entities during the beginning of the school year because I really believe that this is how we dismantle things like racism. I really believe that this is how we get these kids thinking and looking at each other in different ways that they haven't before. And my hope is that the effects will be exponential, that it won't just stop here at the end of my fifth grade class. And all of a sudden I've got children from different parts of the world seeing each other differently for the first time and they're saying okay so you kind of know my story and it goes on and on like that and we see this beautiful web being created of um, the connections they make to each other and and the friendships we started a westward expansion unit 
and I thought we needed a, a little more of the backstory from how people got to this country and who was here first and, and what that looks like. And we started looking at those stories, the, the perspectives that were not accounted for generally in the history books um, or in our social studies curriculums. So remember, so when we say Columbus, you know, discovered these people, can you discover something that's already there? linking those things, making the connections, then it doesn't seem so distant, then it doesn't seem so removed from their daily lives. So always when I'm teaching, I have this um, underlying goal of critical thinking, analysis, what does that look like? But they do it without knowing that they're doing it, and that's the serendipity of teaching. You know, discovered these people, can you discover something that's already there? linking those things, making the connections, then it doesn't seem so distant, then it doesn't seem so removed from their daily lives. So always when I'm teaching, I have to present this award for culturally responsive teaching. Congratulations, everybody. Okay, now I want to introduce the work of Katie LaCroix, Catherine Katie LaCroix, a literary, a literacy specialist at Logan Elementary School in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who also heads up her school's equity team. Katie strives to learn as much as she can about her students and incorporate that into her instruction. Unfortunately, Katie could not be here today because she had a previous engagement. She's getting married later today. <laughs> so everyone, a round of applause for Katie in absentia. <laughs> um, she reaches her children in many amazing ways. Let's watch her in her classroom. Now that we've shared that, I'd like for a few of you to give me a positive for today. Positive, Julia? Today after school, me and my dad are going to see my aunt because today's her birthday. Oh, today's her birthday. Well, tell your aunt that we say happy birthday. And another positive. I started the positives probably in my third year teaching. It's a way for me to get to know the students at a more personal level because they share something that's going on either at home or something they're excited about about their family and that can be really insightful in terms of planning lessons. I can take what they tell me and then I can incorporate it into the lessons to make the classroom more inclusive. I realized that this diverse group of students had all developed white main characters. So then I'm sitting there looking at this work and I'm thinking I'm on this equity team and I need to do something right now. This is a really teachable moment. The equity team is a group of educators who, one, they have a passion for this work. And this work is meeting the needs of our underrepresented students, meeting the needs of those students who are historically referred to as those kids in the achievement gap. There is no achievement gap. There is a teaching gap. The onus is on the teachers. The onus is not on those students. And if you know uh, the pronunciation of a word that comes up in the book, uh, one of the Arabic words, if you want to raise your hand and tell me what the pronunciation would be, that would be appreciated. So this is a book about Eid. Can someone tell us what Eid is? Anyone knows what Eid is? Eid is like it's a holiday for Muslims, and they um, go with their families and do prayer, and then they get to go do fun stuff with their family. I think that the real purpose of engaging the students through focusing on these focal students is that these happen to be students that maybe don't always see themselves in the curricula because in public education, if you look in the textbooks, it's very much a white curriculum. So by embracing their cultures and bringing, even if it's a snapshot of their culture in and making them feel connected, it makes them feel like they're truly a part of the classroom and valued by the teacher. 
Zach, you want to say that for me? Because I know you say it better than I can say it. This is what it says. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Zach.